Megan, unlock the door. You know what gives? I'm soaked. Imagine how she feels. I'm just as desperate to find her as you are. Start calling. Now you did mention um, as far as some of the, you know, the financial realm of it and getting investors or financing for production. Um, you mentioned that some of the laws have been changing or to allow you to do more with that. Would you mind explaining a little more of like what you used to have to do and what you might be able to do now? Yeah. Just so, to give them just kind of a comparison as to yeah, sure. what so, life is like. So um, there's, so with, with um, a lot of the stuff with small business and trying to support small business and support people um, being able to pull together projects on their own, not relying on big corporations to do that. There's been some lax, laxation in the laws around going, being able to go directly to someone and say, hey, I want you to invest in this film. Because some of the laws before were such that you couldn't have someone that was part of your production team who would, who would benefit from their investment mm -hmm. asking for the investment. Because the idea is, if, if you go and ask somebody, give me $100,000 to put in this film, and that's going back into your pocket, there were some concerns and legal issues around how that would happen. Okay. So some of the laws have changed that allow you to do um, directly ask people for investment, which means that the concept of crowdsourcing, um, crowdsourcing is like um, Indie, is Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Um, that's crowdsourcing, but it's a different type of crowdsourcing because those two, you promise people like trinkets, right? A DVD, show up for a ticket. They're not really investors. They don't have any ownership in the film. Whereas the way things are moving, we'll be able to perform crowdsourcing and actually get investors. So you can have a $20 investor. You can have a $100 investor. And maybe they're not getting a huge return on their investment, but that $20, whatever percentage that is of your final income, they're maybe going to get that back. So it laxes things and it makes it so that there's a whole realm of people that otherwise wouldn't really be investing for any value. Now crowdsourcing can pull in money, right? Um, private placement rem memorandum is um, a legal document that's used um, by the attorneys to make sure that if somebody invests in your film, it kind of walks around what happens if you don't get to pay them back and it covers you mm -hmm. and it covers them. Um, it also allows them to um, you know, look into a lot of the tax incentives and helps formulate and um, uh, really nail down how that works. So that's something that um, you know, my close friend, Lavender Gill, who is a director producer in Winston-Salem has since moved to Arizona, um, it's one of the things that he introduced me to. I mean, because one of the things about film school, um, at least when I went, they taught you a lot about the practice of the production. They taught you a lot about you know, theory and about pre-production, directing actors. What they didn't tell you about is how you get investors. Mm -hmm. They didn't tell you about the legal aspects of pulling together a PPM or getting an entertainment lawyer, how much that cost, you know, a lot of money. You're talking about just for doing these things that support and, and lift up your, your operation, um, your production. So I think that's one important thing that is often missing. And I think it's okay as long as you're, you're, you're just kind of like an indie, you know, filmmaker shooting from the hip mm -hmm. and you're kind of looking at not necessarily having a wide distribution on something right. but if you're really looking at doing something that is going to be in theaters or have a good DVD presence um, it's going to get investment and possibly get picked up you have to look at these legal aspects and you have to make sure that you're um, you're in tune with them and you have somebody who's an expert on them working on your staff so I don't have that someone yet yeah, I was going to say this, so there's there's a lot as far as financing a film that's just more than Hey, here's my idea. Do you think it's good? Do you want to give me some money for it? Right. Like, there's lots that I mean, you have to get other people involved. Like you're right. saying, an entertainment lawyer right. and an attorney, you know, yeah. attorney try and actually set up. Apparently, like people to go look for investors. Right. You can't approach them yourself. Oh, right. And, and now, yeah, possibly can. Yeah. I mean, so a lot of that changes in, in understanding. So a lot of the law is still kind of gray. So you know, that's where you hire an attorney to help you figure it out. So what I know about it, I've read about in Independent Filmmaker magazine and on, online. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a big buzz right now. And so getting an attorney who is learned about that, mm -hmm. who has had enough time to figure it out because it's just a recent uh, change and amendment to the law, I think that's an important thing to consider. So, you know, 
I'll, I'll say that one of the things that I've benefited from in, in having to work in corporate America is that I have the business acumen to know that these are things that I have to do. You know, yeah. I'm a project manager, I am a, a business process lead in what I do by, by day. And those things are applied to my, my everyday, to my filmmaking, right? Because there's a practical aspect of it that we creative people hate, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, I hate that stuff. But I also but it, helps. A, it, it helps, right? It helps and so much. It does. And I mean, I'm a tinker. I like to tinker. So I'll get into it as much as I have to. And I'm like, I just don't want to do this crap anymore. <laughs> you know, so. Right. And that makes sense. And that's a really good, honestly, that's really good to hit on is, is the, because just generally being what I consider a creative person myself and like knowing a lot of drawers, painters, artists, filmmakers, that type of thing. We do hate that aspect right. of organization. Like, right. I don't want to mess with the scheduling. I don't, that's not important. We'll just, it'll come with it. It'll, it'll be fine. We'll feel it out. And, but it's obviously a benefit to actually have that background yeah. of being able to organize and delegate or, you know, even just time manage more than anything, it seems would be a great benefit to you. Absolutely. In your profession. Absolutely. And, um, I mean, to that, just to, to, Hit the hit on that again and highlight that. I mean, a director, in my opinion, right? You have to have. It's a it's a hard job, right? It's a it's a job you love. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing everything you need to do, you have to know how to manage people. You have to know how to manage a crew. You have to know how to manage a set. You have to know project management because you have to be able to set up. Um, your production and perform your pre-production, do your production boards, do your cast and shot list, do your, your dailies. And you have to be able to um, have a producer's eye to things. You know, am I wasting money on this shot or not? And there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through and you have to have, if you have pre-existing relationships, you're allowed to take money. If you don't, you're, this is the way it used to be, you're not, you, you are. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, if you don't, you're not. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's a lot of that business aspect to it that I think is really important and understanding I mean it's one of those things like where you start talking about legality so whether or not you know the law if you violate the law you're still in trouble you can't say I didn't know right right you can't say oh me a culpa I'll move on so I think that's something that it would behoove people to familiarize themselves with the law and to have have an attorney involved where they can. I mean, the other thing we're talking about here, just to kind of level set though, is what kind of production are you shooting? Are you, sh are you shooting a feature film? Mm -hmm. Is it a feature film in which you have a budget to fund a cast, um, to fund a crew, um, to have craft services, to have put people up in hotels if you need to, or is it a film that's, you know, a feature which is just as good, but a bunch of buddies who come together, ask people for favors, and they get it done? There's merits to both, right? right? But I think understanding the legal ramifications of what you can or can't do is something that every filmmaker should take the due diligence to take a look at. So I think it's an important aspect of, of this business that is often overlooked. Um, do they touch it on it? I mean, in any aspect, as far as in school and y like. Yeah, I mean, the investment part is what they kind of leave out a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, they kind of dabble in it. Um, like, I mean, when I was in school, like at Loyola, pre-production and production, you know, that's hit on, you know, and that's obviously a lot of filmmakers just you figure that out by mistake, right? right. Trial and error. So it's not something that's really like, you know, some secret hidden thing, mm -hmm. but. Um, a lot of the legal aspects, I mean, I think film programs would be benefit from having at least a two to three week um, cap on a given production series that says, look, now for the directors, here's what you need to know. For the producers, here's what you need to know. And like producing school, yeah, they talk about all this stuff. Right. But it's against what's your specialization as well. Mine was just kind of like, loyal is more of a generic. Um, you'll learn producing, you'll learn directing, you'll learn writing, you'll learn, you know, cinematography, and you'll learn editing. When you go to somewhere like, you know, North Carolina School of the Arts, very robust program, very specialized in some areas, UCLA, USC, um, you kind of get on a track, and that track is what you stick with. And for me, um, you know, aside from the fact that I applied to one school, Loyola, and got into it, um, you know, it was also because I owned my film, USC owns your film when you're done with it, UCLA. And I wanted to go there, you know, if I would have taken the time to actually apply there, maybe I would have gone. Maybe things would be a little different, actually. But um, 
I think Loyal was a good school for what it was, you know, and getting through and just learning every aspect of the business. So. So if nothing else, would you maybe even recommend like people that are going into film like take just like a business class or like some sort of not a business class necessarily, <coughs> but a uh, more business oriented like organizational class. I don't even know yeah, what yeah. would qualify no, as such sure. in college so, just so that they could have that kind of just know the thought process that has to go into that idea. Yeah. Would that help them? I think I think so. I mean I think it's I think it's important for people to do what they don't want to do a lot of times because it will help you grow. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have if you have a if you have a challenge in your life or a conflict, I think that makes people stronger. Um, and I think that if you're in film school, um, or if you're just going to college and you happen to take some film classes, or you're going to CPCC, um, whatever it is, I think that if you do have the opportunity to take a quick class in financing. I mean, project management is huge. Take mm -hmm. a project management class because whether you like it or not, initially you're going to be working for somebody to make money. You might as well be working for somebody as a project manager, making some bank, you know, putting some money away, understanding how to project manage and building that into your film career than, you know, flipping burgers or yeah. something else, right? Kind so of use the the job you have to have until you get yeah. Well, that's that's been my path, right? So, I mean, I, you know, when I, when I was in um, when I was in LA, I went to school in LA, and I was there for about five years. So, I did a lot of um, intern work, and I did a lot of work. I, I was a second AC on this film called Six String Samurai mm -hmm. by Lawrence Munguia, who's one of the graduates of my school. So, I've seen that. Yeah, it's that's a, it's a pretty good film. It's a good film. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to be on that set as well. And one of my good friends was the uh, first AC, and he brought me in. Uh, for a week and um, it was an interesting film to be part of and I, I worked as an office PA on a couple of independent films um, this film called Dinner and Driving which is a brilliant film um, it's with a guy named Joey Slotnick who was from The Single Guy with Jonathan Silverman that TV show okay. and he's been on a few things since I think he's actually on a, a recurring series now but he was the star of the show and it kind of didn't go anywhere because it really didn't get a lot of distribution but I mean, you can pick it up on Amazon it's a great movie um, and then I worked for uh, Morgan Freeman's company for a while as an intern, did a lot of script coverage. I got to meet the man. He's like this tall. That's he's awesome. like, and he's an amazingly <laughs> nice guy. And his son, Alfonso, looks exactly like him. Really? And he, if you watch Seven, Alf Alfonso typically is in all the films that Morgan's in. Um, Alfonso was in, um, in Seven. He played one of the guys who's looking up the fingerprints. <laughs> and it's, they look so similar that they actually had to kind of make him look a little different. <laughs> had to like so, put some makeup on him to Yeah, change well, him? just kind of have his beard a little okay, bit different. Because okay. they look very similar. Um, and then I worked at a company called Kushner Lock, which did uh, Reese Witherspoon's first film. I can't remember what that was. It was about a little red writing type thing with Kiefer Sutherland. Can't remember what the name of it was, but I don't know, I'm, um, I'm gonna look that up. <laughs> yeah, it was actually a really interesting film. It was is kind of weird, and and I got to meet her when I was there. She was really nice. So it's like all that stuff, great. Did yeah. all that, but I wasn't making any money, right? Because they're not paying an intern much. Right. And a lot of my friends have stuck with it and persevered, and now they're writing for TV and they're doing th big things. And you know, for me, it was a question of. Do I want to stay here and kind of collect unemployment and try to do this thing and s try to make ends meet, or you know I'm the type of person that I need a little bit of safety net. Mm -hmm. I need some security. So I stuck with uh, corporate America, kind of putting some money away, paying off my graduate school debt, which is ridiculously expensive, and I'm still yeah. going to be paying off for 30 years. But the idea is that that gave me a safety net. And whether right, wrong, or indifferent is the path I've taken. Just kind of like in How to Jump Out of a Moving Car, I'm on that highway, everybody is. What you decide to do with that is up to you, right? person just leaves you stranded like that. It's pissed, Catherine. I messed up. Yeah, but dude, come on, it's not like you did it on purpose, right? Seriously? I think it's appropriate for me to discuss the finer points of my relationship with you, Bob. You didn't do it on purpose, did you? 
<laughs> Why would I purposely let my girlfriend's dog run away, Catherine? I don't know. I just find it weird enough that you have a dog living with you under the same roof. I mean, dude, I always wanted a dog, and you're always totally against it. Yeah, well. Things change. Turn me. And for me, it's kind of this concept of having like two brains, right? There's my creative self that loves to listen to music and just go wild and have a good time and thinks up all these things. And there's that practical checkpoint that kind of is, is this, you know, I can switch between the two. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I feel fortunate that I can do that. I was going like, to say, that's, <laughs> that's a pretty decent talent. I was gonna say, do you find that they conflict from time to time and you, they do because, you can't decide what to do right. because you know, businessman here wants to do this because it's going to make the most sense, but right. the artist is telling you, you should do this, it's going to look better. Right. Well, I mean, it, for the businessman really is, is motivated out of fear. <laughs> okay. So, to be honest with you, I mean, fear of, am I going to keep a roof over my head? Fear of, am I going to have enough money to finish this project? Whereas the other person, you know, the creative side is just like, it's like a kid that just wants to give the world a big hug, right? Just I want to I want to share things with people. Right. I want to open doors for people. Yeah, I want to you know let somebody in on the highway when they turn on their turn signal. Just weird little stuff like that. Like I love people, right? And I want to show people how much I love them, and I want to show about the human experience because there's nothing like it. Yeah. You know. So. Fantastic. Here, dog. Come on, dog. Stupid little shit. What, you think she crawled under a rock? the last time you saw something like that? I don't know. I can't even remember the last time I looked up. <laughs>